Hi everybody, I'm Pesto. Thanks so much for coming to my talk on AI security here at B-Sides DFW 2020. This is my second year in a row doing B-Sides DFW. I'm super excited to be here. I'm so excited to talk to you about AI security, some of the th projects I've been working on, some of the things I've learned over the last year. Let's start out real quickly going over kind of what the presentation is going to look like from here. Uh, I'll introduce myself and talk a little bit about AI, a little bit about a 10,000 foot view of AI security before we talk about some of the specific threats and attacks um, that we deal with in AI security. Uh, some further considerations, um, those are really important, really interesting. Uh, and finally, we'll go over a little bit about how we might mitigate some of these uh, attacks. Hopefully we'll do um, a, a good Q&A afterwards too. So just to start out, um, I've been doing this for about 20 years. Um, I met up with a, uh, a fun group back in the uh, early 2000s, late 90s, early 2000s named Ninja Networks. I've been hanging out with them for a long time. We used to do a lot of fun things at DEF CON. Um, mo mostly them. I was kind of the distant Texas contingent of, of Ninja Networks. But nonetheless, uh, we did a lot of fun things at DEF CON, and I've, I've sprinkled some pictures of, uh, of some of the shenanigans at DEF CON over the, over the years um, from Ninja Networks um, that I think are fun. So I hope you enjoy those. But um, apart from that, I've actually been a professional since 2000. Started out doing things like um, firewalls and IDS, you know. Um, but since then, I, I moved on to doing some uh, some some more like pen test and incident response stuff, a little bit of forensics works. Um, but for the last 10 years, I de dealt mainly with insider threat, with corporate insider threat. And I became somewhat of a specialist in that field. Uh, but for the last year, I started a new job doing AI security, and this is what I'm here to talk to you about today and go over some of the cool stuff that I've learned. And it's important to kind of think that or, or to understand my background, that I don't come from a data science background. I don't come from a mathematics background. I come from a hacker background and an information security background. So I'm approaching AI security from that angle, whereas a lot of the researchers um, who are into AI security have a more uh, formal education background or a more background in, in science and data science. Before we go any further, I want to make it clear that even though I do this for a living and even though I went to school for this, none of the information I'm presenting here is representative of my company or of my school. Um, these are all products of my own research over the last year into AI security and shouldn't be considered uh, official statements from, from any particular organization. So with that in mind and that out of the way, let's talk a little bit about AI. And first thing I want to do is differentiate the term AI from some of the other terms, right? Um, I'm going to use the term AI because it's easy and people recognize it, but it's really not the most precise term. AI has been around for a long time and it encompasses a lot of different technologies, a lot of different concepts. Um, more specifically, I'm mainly talking about neural networks. And neural networks are a way to enable, they're one technique that enables machine learning. And machine learning is one type of AI. So that's the relationship between neural networks, machine learning, and AI. Again, forgive me, I, I choose to use the term AI 99 times out of 100 in this talk, you can substitute the word neural the words neural networks for AI and you'll you'll be right. Um, we should also talk a little bit about machine learning. It mainly falls into two categories. And the first category is where I have a bunch of data and I don't really know how to organize this data. I don't really know what groups exist within this data. And I need a way to kind of sort them out, separate them out and, and cluster them together. Uh, so I have models that allow me to do that just by looking at the at the data um, without any other information. So this is um, a priori, just looking at the data, what do I see inherent in the data that, that I can make divisions or separations on? And that's called unsupervised learning. We're mainly not talking about unsupervised learning in this talk. What, what we're mainly talking about is supervised learning. And what that means is that um, I provided on top of like the data, I provided labels to that data. Okay, so the example I'm going to use is uh, uh, throughout this talk is um, an AI model that identifies hot dogs in pictures. You send it a picture, it tells you if there's a hot dog in there. Um, the way we would do this theoretically is we would have this huge selection of hot dog pictures 
from all different angles, right? All different types of hot dogs. And they're all labeled hot dogs, so the AI knows what they are. The AI learns what a hot dog looks like from all of those pictures, and that's called the training data or the training set, right? And once it's trained based on that training set, it can kind of generalize the abstract concept of a hot dog, meaning that when you send it new pictures of hot dogs that it's never seen before, it still knows it's a hot dog because it's so clever because we've trained it so well off of our training set. It's important that we kind of have a basic understanding of what training data is because it factors in a lot into uh, AI security. Now with that out of the way, I want to kick things off by showing an example of why AI security deserves special consideration. And it's one of the key takeaways from this talk. One of the things I really want to impress is that we may think that because AI is just a program, um, if it doesn't really need any special treatment. It's, a, it's an application, right? And we already have, you know, tons of information security practices around how to secure applications, right? All up and down the stack. But one of the things I'd like for you to take away, if I do a good job explaining this to you, is the idea that that just doesn't work for AI. There's special considerations when it when we talk about um, this kind of AI, especially these, these neural networks, and why they deserve special consideration. So in this picture, in this GIF, we see researchers shining white lights with a uh, commodity projector onto the road and the car thinks that it's uh, actual lane and the car swerves and we can understand why this would be very dangerous um, if this were to be done you know outside of, of uh, controlled research now this isn't especially technical or sophisticated for a a sleepy driver may actually make the same mistake right but one of the things we can't really get into is the philosophical difference between an AI making mistake and a human making mistake, but there is a big difference. But what I wanted to focus on was thinking about the information security principles that we all know. How would any of them stop this attack, right? There are some things that are kind of universal, but the the point I want to make is like there's no firewalls or lockdowns or um you know encryption that's going to fix the guy on the side of the road with the projector. Um, some of you might have seen the guy who caused a traffic jam on uh, Google Maps by having a radio flyer wagon full of cell phones with the location turned on. Call this the radio flyer attack. It's this kind of um, attack. This is one kind of attack I should say that we have to take into consideration when we're um, deploying AI into the wild. I want to bring to your attention this uh, graph on the right. This is made by a man named Nicholas Carlini, who's a bit of a rock star in AI security. Um, he uh, helped found an attack called the Carlini Wagner attack, named after him and um, the co author. He's done tons of talks, writes tons of papers. He's a very accomplished uh, researcher and uh, developer. He keeps track of all of the papers, the, the research papers that are released on a specific type of AI security flaw, um, attack called adversarial examples or adversarial perturbations. And we're gonna talk about those later on today, but they're just one type of attack. And you can see here, just in the last year, we're talking about people are releasing more than one paper a day. It's blowing up. And I personally haven't seen anything so, wild wild west since you know the late 90s or early 2000s since the the internet boom when you know back then there were no um you couldn't get a degree in information security right i mean i, I don't know if there were any real certifications back when i started um there's very little way to find good guidance on how to secure networks it's very similar uh in the ai space today because these attacks are specific to ai because they're not covered by traditional information security practices, it's a bit of the wild, wild west. And there's not any real um, authority we can look to for guidance on how to securely deploy AI. And that's the second takeaway I want you to have from this talk is that, um, that this is important and right now it's really open and there's not a lot of guidance there, right? We'll talk about the third takeaway a little bit later, but... Um, if we, if, if we at least remember the, the first two, that information security practices aren't going to cover it for AI and that there's no established guidance, then I think we've done pretty well already. I'll see if I can convince you of some of this uh, as we go on. Let's talk about why AI is at risk. 
This may be apparent to some of you. It may not be. It, a lot of us just like to hack things because we think it's fun, even though it may not benefit us in one way or, or another other than bathing in the sweet glory of the attack. Um, but there's, this is a real deal. If, if you have, for example, a um, an AI that uh, predicts whether or not a applicant will pay back a loan, and based on that decision, uh, your financial institution chooses to give this person money or not. If I was somebody with not very good credit, it might benefit me to get an answer out of that AI to, to persuade that AI, to trick that AI into making a decision it wouldn't normally make. Um, another attack is not about getting a favorable decision, but about stealing the model itself. Um, this may be IP, uh, it may be a competitive advantage, whatever. Um, stealing the model itself is, is also another attack. And finally, um, the information that was used to train the model. We're going to talk a little bit about how that's at risk. Um, what's important, I guess, at this point to say is that none of the attacks, almost none of the attacks we're going to talk about require privilege escalation. These aren't hacks in that sense of, um, you know, gaining authorization where you didn't have it and, um, or exploiting, um, uh, code um, in order to to penetrate uh, a defense or access a server or access a resource. We're not going to do any of that stuff. We're simply going to use the AI in a way that it wasn't intended to be used. It's pretty fun. Um, but I wanted to make that clear that none of this involves, um, very little of it re requires privilege escalation. There are a couple of times that we, we think about um, what could happen if somebody did have access, but I try to stay away from that stuff. This is the CIA triad. You may you may recognize this. Um, if you don't, don't worry. Um, just this is a way that a lot of uh, it, information security is taught that if we consider the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of our data, then we're doing a good job of uh, securing that data. We, we're in, in improving our security posture um, the more that we can assure the, the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of our data. What I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about how these differ when we talk about AI from what they mean when we talk about information security. I'm also going to show you how this falls short and what needs to be added to this to cover AI. Uh, and I'm going to start out by fudging a little bit and say availability is pretty much availability. I don't know of any real special AI-specific attacks on availability. I mean, it's either available or not. If you, Yeah, you can ask it so many questions, it can't answer any others. But just know it's it's better that your model is available than if it's not available. But, but, but barring availability, we're going to talk about AI-specific threats, how they fit into the CIA triad, and how they don't fit into the CIA triad. Let's start out with confidentiality. In tr traditional information security, right, confidentiality is about, you know, keeping data that shouldn't be seen by, by people unseen, right? When we think about confidentiality, we think about like authorization, you know, encryption, right? Perimeter defenses, um, a lot is covered under, um, under confidentiality. It's about keeping private data private, right? Same thing in AI, but specifically, right? When we talk about, when I talk about confidentiality in AI, what I'm talking about is um, an attack called model extraction. I'm talking about keeping the model private. Um, AI is almost, as far as I know, like unprecedented in that how much avail information is available on AI. If you wanted to go like build an, a very powerful nuclear submarine, you may be able to find plans on the internet, download them and build it. And it may work. I don't think so. I wouldn't do it. You may be able to, but you can do that with AI. And AI is very, very powerful. Granted, maybe not as powerful as a nuclear submarine, but you never know when you're dealing with AI, right? Um, and it's all out there. And it's relatively easy. I won't say it's simple, but it's relatively easy to get started in and to start building your own models. Um, tons of free classes out there, tons of YouTube videos. It's, it's, it's wide open. And, and AI has a... Neural networks, especially, have a um, a feature known as transferability. And what transferability means is that an AI that's good at doing one thing is probably good at doing that thing, right, across the board, no matter no matter what the inputs are. Let me explain it a little bit better. If I had, uh, you know, my hot dog identifier, and you could throw any hot dog at this AI, and you're not going to get a hot dog past this. This model is is just the best hot dog identifier in the universe, right? 
chances are. If it's good at identifying hot dogs, it's probably also good at identifying enemy Warcraft. Uh, Warcraft. <laughs> enemy aircraft, right? Um, or um, political dissidents, right? Or things that we weren't necessarily thinking of when we designed this model, used in ways that we, we didn't want it to be used or, or may not have known it could be used for. This makes um, models particularly attractive to, to theft, right? If you have a, a, a model that's really good and I want that model, um, then perhaps I might try to steal that from you. And the way, one of the ways we could do that is, yeah, to lift the, the server that it's on onto the back of the truck. Or we could, you know, um, get a shell and, and SCP it out or, or whatever. But... um. But what I'm going to talk about is something called model extraction. And in this attack, what we're doing is we're basically asking your AI a lot of questions and learning or actually getting your AI to train my AI. So if I wanted a hot dog identifier, um, I might build a, a rudimentary model that basically just learns right from another model from your model and i send your model hey is this a hot dog and your model says yes that's a hot dog oh now my ai knows it's a hot dog right and if you say no it's not well i know that 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 picture is a little bit different and that's not a hot dog and i can build this very similar um set and i can optimize right my ai to match your answers. And once I've done that, once your AI is trained my AI, we have an AI that is almost indistinguishable. I've basically copied your model. I've extracted your model. And then I can do a lot of things with it. For example, I can transfer it to, uh, to, to identify other things, perhaps Warcraft, whatever that is, right? Uh, I guess the box DVD sets, I don't know. Um, enemy aircraft or whatever else I want. Um, so that's transferability, right? That's model extraction. And there's one more concept I want to talk about, and that's the concept of a surrogate model. There's one more use for this. If I extract your model, I now have this, this surrogate copy. And what I can do is I can hammer at that with a bunch of different attacks, trying to see what works. And once I've got, uh, a good attack down, then I can launch it against your AI with a very fairly fairly confident that it will work because it worked against the surrogate. Does that make sense? So it's kind of like having your own lab copy to, to hammer out on. So uh, the surrogate model, um, model extraction, model transferability, OES, and machine learning as a service. Let's say your business is providing machine learning services. For example, um, other people might want their pictures, their hot dogs identified in pictures. So they might, you know, pay you a nickel each time they send you a query asking you if this, if there's a hot dog in this picture, right? So what might happen is each time they're asking you is they're training another model until they don't need your model anymore because they've got a surrogate model and they don't need your service anymore. Um, if you're offering uh, machine learning as a service, it's something to be aware of. Uh, it's per per as you're particularly susceptible to this kind of attack, or at least um, this kind of attack would affect you perhaps more than it would affect other other people. So we talked about model extraction and surrogate models and a bunch of cool stuff. I'm going to talk about integrity now. We think of data integrity or file integrity. We're talking about um, making sure that we can trust the data, that it hasn't been fiddled with, that we can trust um, where it's coming from, things like that. Um, technologies that come into mind are, uh, are things like hashing, you know, um, checksums, uh, things of that nature, certificates. But with AI, I'm going to talk a little bit about poisoning. And, and data poisoning is, a, I think, a fairly intuitive concept. Um, if I am depending on this set of training, this training set, I'm depending that all of these things are labeled correctly. <clears throat> I'm depending on that fact, I should say. Well, if you're able to put in a bunch of pictures of hamburgers labeled hot dogs, and my model learns that hamburgers look like hot dogs, and it starts incorrectly identifying hot dogs where there are none, 
Um, if I'm able to put in those pictures of the hamburgers, then I've poisoned your model. Now, one way to do that is to, yes, um, either access the database um, without authorization or, or what, whatever, um, or the, the data warehouse, wherever these pictures are, and just put them there. But I, I'm not really going to talk about that too much because I think um, traditional information security practices would kind of apply there. What I am going to talk about is the fact that we often don't have control of the training data. We often put that control initially in the hands of end users uh, or even the public at large, right? Um, it, you, you may think, um, for example, oh, a uh, good example of spam filters. So let's say you have a button that says report spam. And imagine that when you click, you see spam in your inbox and you click report spam. I want you to imagine that that is sent to an AI. And what you've sent to the AI is the content that says, you know, you know, the piece of spam and the label, this is spam. Well, then you have, you can build a, a training set and then your model can learn what spam looks like. And when we roll out that model, it'll start denying those kinds of emails. So what will happen, of course, is that the spammers will change how the spam looks a little bit until it bypasses the filter and you click, this is spam again. And then your model is updated. In this case, we've ceded control of our training set into the users. And enough malicious users or enough malicious use or the right malicious use could enable a spammer to bypass the spam filter um, basically by mislabeling data. Um, or it, they're, they're a little bit more sophisticated than that. They label certain phrases and then include those phrases in um in key pieces in, in the pieces of email but you can think of it just simply as the model says okay there's a line and on th all the the spam is over here right and all the ham all the good email is over here and what we want to do is we want to take a email out from this side and we want to put it on that side and that'll allow us right to send that email and what we need to do is we just need to move that line just a little bit. And that's called model drift, right? And that's a, a an indicator of model poisoning, of doing exactly what we just talked about. You can measure this. One way, a good way to mitigate this is to have a known input and known output of your model and make sure it's consistent. Or if it's not, that you understand why or whatever. Um, because if it's not, if, if you're starting to suddenly get different answers, you, it may be an indication of model drift. And model drift can happen in the normal course of business, but could also be a uh, an indicator of compromise. Um, back doors. There's a the terminology is not necessarily um, equivalent to what it would be in infosec. Uh, not everybody uses the term back doors, but there are papers I, I, that that use the term. What what they mean when they when they say back door is basically poisoning the data and hiding not really hiding the fact but not exploiting the fact until later that's all it means um so for example if we had right turn signs and we were teaching um cars to learn what a right turn sign is by noticing a car turning right and then noticing all the signs that are around it and finding the common turn, right turn sign well let's say someone started putting markings on those right turn signs and your ai learns that those markings are part of what a right turn sign looks like and you deploy this model, um, you know, in, in all of your, your wonderful cars, no one's going to notice anything wrong. It doesn't have to have those markings. It can see the rest of the sign and say it's still a right turn sign. But if it does see those markings on something like a stop sign, if I then go mark, put those markings on stop signs and it's able to fool your AI, then I've triggered that back door. So it's still, it's still, you know, model poisoning. It's still, um, in this case, data poisoning, but, um, it's not really evident and it's not really triggered till later and we it's, it's called a backdoor so again no privilege escalation is required to do this um in a, in many many cases especially with dealing with model drift and it's surprising that the, the spam filter was one example but it's surprising how often because it takes so much data to train ai that that data is sourced from places where it was out of our control Talked about C, talked about the I, glossed over the A. Now we're going to talk about the RP. 
And I, I would like to you to introduce you to the CIARP Pentad. It's a very catchy name. It This is not a thing. I just made this up. Um, but if you want to make it a thing, I'm cool with that. You can just go around talking about the CIARP Pentad as if everybody should know what it is. Um, I think that, that, that you should. Um, absolutely. Uh, but anyway, um, we're, I've added privacy and robustness. Privacy... Uh, we all know what it is. Uh, we all know how important it is. We all know that nobody cares about it, but they should. Um, but uh, again, I'm going to differentiate what we're what why privacy is is a little bit different when we talk about AI. But I'm going to spend the most time talking about robustness and adversarial perturbation. This is what Nicholas Carlini was graphing earlier, and this is really kind of the meat and potatoes of AI security. This is what all the hubbub is. This is where a, a lot of the research is. Um, so let's get into it, right? W model robustness is the ability or the degree to which your model withstands um, attacks from adversarial perturbations. So I'm going to talk about this attack that we see on the right-hand side. This is a gentleman in the top left uh, picture, right? Um, using a state-of-the-art at the time, facial recognition AI was correctly identified as himself. When he put on the funny glasses, he was identified as Mila Jovovich. One of the interesting things about this attack is that this is called a targeted attack, and there's a couple of different use cases we can think of. The first one is in a future, far future, dystopian place where, where this would never surely happen in real life, but imagine if you could. Um, facial recognition technology at airports that looked at your face and compared it to a, the faces of known wanted people, right? And if there was a match, then you weren't able to board the plane and uh, the marshals came and got you and made your day very bad. In that case, a bad actor wouldn't really care who the AI thought he was as long as the AI didn't think it was him or her or perhaps another bad actor, right? But the point is, is that it doesn't have to target any specific person. It can just be anyone but me. And that's called an untargeted attack. But this is actually a targeted attack. Those are Mila Jovovich glasses. When he puts them on, always Mila Jovovich, not random. A specific pattern on those glasses, and those are just an inkjet printer cut out and, and glued on to, to drugstore glasses. Not very not very high tech, right? Um, convinces the AI that's Mila Jovovich. On the right-hand side, we see a stop sign with some stickers on it that makes the model think it's a speed limit 45. And I don't want to confuse anybody. This is not model poisoning. Not like the stop signs we talked about and just like a slide or two ago. It's completely different. Um, we did not poison the model here. This is just um, the way that this uh, computer vision AI worked, the way it makes its decisions about the difference between a stop sign and a speed limit sign are subtle, more subtle than we may think. And they can be tricked by putting just a few stick, by making small alterations to it. This is just the way... Uh, these uh, these neural networks work. How do we exploit this? Do we just put a bunch of stickers on or do different colors and see what happens? You can. Um, let me know how it works. Or we can use a lot of the uh, available toolkits that are out there to help us by people who have already discovered these attacks. Bully finding new attacks yourself, that is super cool. But to get started, if it, you're new to this, um, we're going to talk about a couple of tools that we can use uh, later on. But I want to talk a little bit more, go a little bit more in depth about an adversarial perturbation because this is often what it looks like right here. Now, these are le read left to right, not up and down. So in the top left, we have the Alps, which it, it kills me that whatever AI this was in this research paper from this picture could not only correctly identify the white bit as a mountain, but as the Alps mountain chain is unbelievable, especially with that degree of certainty. Um, plus, this adversarial perturbation that we generate as a bad actor, as an attacker, as a security tester, right? Um, we overlay one onto the other and we get the input on the right. Now that is called an adversarial example, the image on the right. The ones, and we create that by adding the adversarial perturbations. And we get this kind of snowy figure to the right. Um, in, the, in the lower right on the puffer that's now a crab, it's hardly, hardly noticeable. One of the things I've started to notice is Google CAPTCHA looks like this sometimes now, and I don't know if they're training their models to ignore adversarial perturbations or not, but I can imagine if, like you say, click all the buses and you've you've done um, adversarial perturbation to these pictures, right? They can learn what a um, 
picture of a bus with an adversarial perturbation applied looks like, and they can label it that. So if they ever see, you know, a bus with that adversarial perturbation, they know not to not not to trust the classification from it. Um, they're training. They may be training. I don't think I don't know if they are, but it occurs to me when I saw that that perhaps they're training their model to see adversarial perturbations, which is a way to actually increase your robustness. It's not a great way. Because unfortunately, the workaround is you just add another adversarial perturbation onto that and it does the exact same thing. And then you get into this, like, how many layers deep are we going to go? Um, depending on your use case, it may be feasible, it may not be. Um, and I love this dog, 99.99%. .99%. I wish I could get an AI to be that certain. I mean, if I, if I saw that, I would think my model's overfit. I don't even know if I would trust it. But anyway, 100% that is a grab. Um, a little bit odd but anyway the, the the technology they're talking about is sound the adversarial perturbations do work and because they just operate on the way um, computer vision models work they're very hard indeed to mitigate the best thing to do is just to test this yourself so you know your risk before you uh, deploy and we will talk about how later but first uh, i want to talk just a little bit about data privacy uh, not data privacy uh, model privacy. So this is weird. If I told you, hey, your model may be leaking training information, you may not think that that's that strange. But if you know a lot about AI, you might look at me like I was an idiot because the training data is not located anywhere in the AI. You can delete the training data after the model is trained, you don't need it anymore. So it's not like the model is like checking to make sure or talking to the training data. It's not. If you were to run a debugger on the model, you wouldn't see any information from the training data there. All you would see are the weights it it put to each neuron, to each um, decision kind of it made. It's a, it's, um, a coefficient number. It's not representative of the data. It's of the decision. So, or of the um, feature. Um, so the training data isn't located anywhere in there. Nonetheless, there are certain circumstances in which your model may leak training data. I'm not going to lie. This is not that common. This is kind of a fringe example. It, but it is important to know that these things um, exist because you never know when the next, you know, big, it might blow up, right? Um, this isn't that common. And it requires a very precise kind of set of requirements. And one of them is returning a confidence score. Remember when it said crab 100% or Alps 94%? That's a confidence score. And if you return that to the user, when the user asks you to classify something, it can be kind of used against you. So the, the, the upshot is if you don't have to uh, return a confidence score, don't because this can happen. Basically, you send it a if, – if you have this guy's name, I'm going to call him I don't know, Kyle. Kyle here on the right. Um, If you have his name, right, um, and you have a model – uh, that um, that returns, when you give it a picture, returns a name and a confidence score. Like it's 50% sure that this is Bob and 20% sure that this is Sue or whatever. Um, I can basically just send it random stuff until it thinks it's like 0.001% John. And then I can take that and start building off of it, right? And, and taking that small percentage and optimizing for a larger percentage until I come close to the original picture, right? Um, so I add a squiggle here, a squiggle there, and now I'm at 2%. Oh, great, right? So I keep those, and I keep adding on to those using a specific technique. And we come up with a kind of general idea of the pictures on the left and right, kind of scary images. Um, but this is um, known as model inversion. Um, and it's especially disturbing when it's uh, paired with a concept called membership inference. And membership inference, um, I would imagine it's kind of big in the OSN world. Um, but what it means is that um, if you take uh, one set of data, like the training set, and you uh, combine it with another set of data, right, it becomes, you know, quite powerful. You don't need that much information to positively identify someone. If we look at the example on the right from this white paper, we can see that a publicly available voter registration list that's available for purchase contained all this information, including zip, birth, the date, and sex. And if we match that zip, birth, date, and sex against medical data, 
we can ex we can kind of glean the name and address of the people in the medical data because not that many people share the zip birthday and uh, sex. You wouldn't think it'd be that precise, but the confidence scores are actually, you can't be 100% sure, but the confidence scores are rather high in this example. So that's membership imprints, and when it's teamed with model inversion, it can mean some, some pretty nasty stuff. This is still a little bit fringe, and it does require a very specific set of, um, you know, setup in the environment. So hopefully that was super helpful or interesting, at least. Maybe I think it's kind of exciting, personally. Um, and I put further considerations at the end, and I didn't talk a lot about it. Not because they're not important, but because I didn't want to scare anybody away um, from the third takeaway, which is things that we don't normally talk about when we talk about information security. In the context of AI, we should. I'm going to make the argument that explainability, ethics, and fairness should be the job of the information security professional, of the people who are um, doing AI security. The biggest reason for that is that nobody else is right now. And that doesn't mean that people don't care. Tons of people out there are doing great work on this, tons of great research, not many of them from an information security background. It's more like if you were to go to someone in your company and say, hey, who's responsible um, for making sure that we're only releasing ethical AI? Who talks to the vendors of the um, applications that we're using that use AI? Um, who's making sure that those vendors are enforcing fairness and ethics standards? And if you do that, I would love for you to email me uh, what their answer is because it's so new, not a lot of people are paying attention to this, and it's a big deal. Um, it doesn't matter how like secure your AI is, how well you're protected against um, adversarial perturbations and model inversion. If your AI is out there doing things an AI shouldn't be doing in the first place, right? Um, or if your AI is, is making unfair uh, decisions. Um, I'm going to talk real quick about explainability. Um, explainability is a bit of a contentious issue. Um, what it means is that if your AI makes a terrible decision that puts you in the news and somebody comes to you and says, how did this happen? Why did your AI choose this? If your answer is something like, I don't know, or nobody knows, or because stats or probabilities, it's not really a great, a great answer. Um, AI explainability is about understanding the features, how what features went into the model and how your model used those features to reach a decision. It doesn't it sounds pretty straightforward. But it's it, it's under it it's kind of contentious because people don't not everybody and I I'm actually one of them, not everybody likes the idea of calling it explainability because it doesn't really explain much. If I tell you um, well, it thought so. You know, it thought it, this was a hot dog because it's kind of red like a hot dog, and it's kind of long like a hot dog. And and I know because I've researched this, and I know, uh, you know, AI explainability is very important to me. So I know that these are the two biggest features that my AI uses in order to make a determination about whether or not it sees a hot dog. Honestly, it doesn't really explain much. Well, what is long? Well, what is, I mean, how red does red need to be, right? And the more you, you, you dig in, the more and more vague your answers get because the answer is like stochastic gradient descent and hard things, right? Things that we don't always necessarily um, understand 100%. And calling that explained is, is misleading. But my, my stance is that any explanation you can give that reaches you closer than nothing, that is more accurate than nothing, is better than nothing, right? Um, my, my stance is that you should be able to do some elementary analysis and understand. You should know what your features are in the model, and you should understand um, how, they, how the model uses them. One of the tools you can use for this is Lyme analysis. Um, Lyme analysis does just that. It tells you what features played into each decision which is another problem with explainability. Here, AI explainability is very important to me. So I've done this complete Lyme analysis. It should answer all your questions. Okay, well, how does the Lyme analysis work? 
Well, you get into the exact same problems. How does an alignment analysis know that this is, you get into the exact same problem? So um, explainability a bit contentious, um, but something's better than nothing. Um, ethics and fairness. There's a couple of different flavors of this, right? The biggest ethical issue is, is should AI be making to this decision at all or should a human being? Is there a human in, in the loop, so to speak? Or does the AI make decisions by itself? And if so, is that okay? Um, like I said at the beginning, there's a difference between AI making a mistake and a person making a mistake. If a person makes a mistake, you can say, Bob, you made a mistake, and we're going to make sure that you don't make this mistake again one way or the other. If AI makes a mistake, who's responsible for it? You don't always have attribution um, to to AI. And sure, people will get out of blame, but we all still kind of know, right? Um, with AI, it, it adds a layer of abstraction that's sometimes very difficult, especially if like, oh, we didn't even make this AI. We bought this AI from AIRS, you know? It can get pretty difficult. And if you're using AI to do something that affects people's lives, and you don't understand how that AI works, you're putting yourself in a very precarious position. And we've seen this before. Unfortunately, this has really affected people's lives before. Um, there is one um, example you can uh, you can look up about an AI that was used in the criminal justice system. It was used to um, basically um, talk uh, rate recidivism. I'm not going to be able to say it, but the odds that uh, someone would, would would commit a crime again would they were they released on parole? So this AI was making suggestions, recommendations about who got parole and who didn't. And it was a pretty racist AI, unfortunately. And the AI learned from actual, you know, parole cases. Right. Um, the unfortunate part about that is is the inherent bias in in law enforcement and in the justice system i should say excuse me um and racism in the justice system was used to train this ai and you got a racist ai out of it um yeah it's it's bad for for people to make decisions based on this but i maintain that it's even worse if ai does especially if people you know don't understand that that's how it works um, we need to be very careful about whether AI should be making these kinds of decisions at all. We need to understand what happens if this doesn't work the same for everybody, right? What if only a certain population is able to receive the benefits from this AI because of the way they look or because of some other, um, you know, protected uh, feature or thing, things like that? Really, that is the most important part. And that's the third takeaway is that as information security professionals, this should be in our domain and under our purview. Almost last. How do we actually go about fixing this? This is really going to be the subject of my next talk, so I'm not going to give it all away here. But I do want to give a little teaser that it begins with a comprehensive risk assessment. It involves really understanding those features and how they're used in AI. It involves understanding the models that are being used and how they're being used. Um, once we've done a lot of, of, of that research, we then start actually um, testing robustness, inversion, all these things we've talked about, and understanding what our risk is. And then we continue to monitor um, as it's in production, as it can t does its inference to see if it's um, behaving correctly. That is pretty much all I've got. I have had so much fun um, talking with you about uh, all this fun stuff. Um, before I go, this is my email address. Reach out to me if you're curious about this, if you're a professional doing this, if I've made a mistake, hit me up in the Q&A or um, hit me up uh, on my email and, and give me both barrels. Archive.org is um, a where a lot of these um, papers are released, where you can get the uh, primary documents, the, you know, the actual source documents and not some article about the document, the actual white papers are. Um, the IBM Art Toolkit, Adversarial Robustness Toolkit, is a very simple toolkit. It, it's it's a library. Um, you use Python, which is what a lot of people uh, code in to do AI. Um, and basically, you just tell it what attacks you want to run against a model, and it goes to town. It's very cool. I've used it and recommend it. Um, it's the IBM Art Toolkit. Um, the IBM Art developers have a Slack that you can join and ask them questions. 
Um, another one that was recently introduced to me um, was is Privacy Raven, and that uses PyTorch, which is um, a little bit uh, of a higher level layer of abstraction, so it makes doing um, AI a little bit easier, um, one might say. Um, and I know the author of Privacy Raven is um, looking for feedback on how it can be, what else it can do, and how it can be improved, and how people are using it. So um, definitely give that a try. There's tons of other ones. Foolbox is out there, Clever Hans. But um, I wanted to bring these two to your attention. XAI is a buzzword. It's explainable AI, and it's a great thing to Google that term, XAI. It'll get you right where you want to be in, in talking about um, explainability. Um, fairness, accountability, and transparency. Google has a good document, and Microsoft has a good document. Um, both of them are are kind of looking into this and coming up with ideas on how we can get um, a handle on, um, on accountability and transparency. Um, finally, the um, AI Village at DEF CON... Uh, these are, uh, they have a Discord. Um, hit them up on Twitter, get information about the Discord, join the Discord, join the discussion. These are really smart folk who are right on the cutting edge of this research. And um, they're, they're, they're good people and, and, and great to, to know and to have as resources to discuss AI security with. And with that, uh, that is my time. I, uh, again, just really appreciate this opportunity to talk again at B-Sides DFW. Thank you so much for attending this. I hope it was um, exciting, maybe interesting at least, maybe useful. But uh, in any event, I really appreciate all of you. Thank you so much, and I'll see you later. Bye-bye.